BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. On the food programme, we aim to bring you the leading experts, the most respected practitioners, the greatest storytellers. And in this edition, I think we have one of the best. My name is Sandor Katz. I call myself a fermentation revivalist. I live in Middle Tennessee. Through his writing, Sandor Katz has inspired home cooks, chefs and food producers to rethink their relationship with the hidden microbes that surround us all. Bacteria and fungi capable of transforming food into longer lasting deliciousness. Humans did not invent or create fermentation. It would be more accurate to state that fermentation created us. Fermentation, broadly speaking, is the transformative action of microorganisms. So fermented foods and beverages are those foods and beverages that have been created by this transformative power of microorganisms. Some of the most famous examples would be bread, cheese, alcoholic beverages, salamis, pickles, sauerkraut. The list really goes on and on. Fermentation comes from the Latin fervere, which means to boil, and it's really because the visible action of fermentation is the bubbles that it produces in liquids. And fermentation has always been understood to be a form of cold boiling or cold cooking. Not only has Sandor helped to rediscover lost knowledge and revive endangered skills, he has traveled the world teaching, sharing his insights, and celebrating the techniques and traditions of others. I have spent nearly two decades exploring the realm of fermentation. I do not have a background in microbiology or food science. I'm just a food-loving, back-to-the-land generalist who became obsessed with fermentation, spurred by a voracious appetite, a practical desire for food not to go to waste, and a willful desire to maintain good health. Sometimes I feel like a mad scientist, tending to as many as a dozen different bubbly fermentation experiments at once. Sometimes I feel like a holy roller evangelist, zealously spreading the word about the glorious healing powers of fermented foods. We've talked with Sandor before on the food program, but in this conversation, we're going global, hearing less familiar fermentation stories from four continents, ingenious foods, and surprising flavors that have survived in Asia, Africa, Europe, and the Americas. So yes, there really is a fermented world beyond sauerkraut. There's lots of interesting examples of indigenous cultures organizing ritual around the practice of fermentation. And in some cases, like people would dance around whatever the liquid they're trying to get to ferment and with the idea that they have to teach the ferment how to dance. Then some people have approached it in exactly the opposite way and created special spaces where the ferment could be protected from people's energy. And it was the idea that, like, you don't want to disturb the ferment. Everywhere in the world where indigenous cultures have survived, there are interesting rituals organized around fermentation. In fact, in his most recent book, Fermentation Journeys, Sandor argues There are no parts of the world where fermented foods can't be found. Because I have not been able to find any counterexamples. You know, every time someone has proposed their idea of a place that had never developed any fermentation traditions, I've been able to find some example of fermentation that that, that contradicts that idea. And, you know, I've, I've come to believe that the reason that fermentation is practiced universally is the simple reality that, you know, everything that makes up our food, all of the plants and all of the animal products that we eat, 
are populated by microorganisms. And so there's a certain inevitability to microbial transformation of our food. And as a practical matter, people everywhere, without the benefit of specifically knowing about microorganisms, observed under what conditions, you know, would the food decompose into a disgusting mess that nobody would ever put into their mouths? And under what contrasting conditions would the food be elevated in some way and become, you know, more delicious or more stable or more easily digestible you know there's always some practical benefit to fermentation and you don't need to understand the microbiology in order to practice fermentation none of the people who developed the techniques in the first place did so story one the asian origins of sauerkraut Sauerkraut was my gateway into fermentation, the first thing that I've fermented. I've written a lot about it, taught thousands of people how to make sauerkraut. And as a result of trying to answer people's questions, I've really delved into the literature that exists about sauerkraut. There's a historical story that, that I have found repeated throughout the literature that suggests that the idea of sauerkraut, the idea of preserving cabbage under salt, came from China. The general idea is that nomadic peoples of Central Asia observed the techniques that they were using in China to, to preserve cabbage and then spread the idea westward through Central Asia and into Eastern Europe. As these techniques spread to different parts of the world, people experimented and adapted them to their surroundings and their preferences. In Croatia and a lot of the other Balkan states, the uh, typical way that cabbage is fermented is not by pre-shredding it and salting it, but rather by fermenting the head of cabbage whole. Generally, in order to do that, you need to cut out the core of the cabbage. So pack as many whole cabbages with the cores removed, packed with salt as you can in your given vessel, and then cover them with water. Although in some places they might just put a very heavy weight on that and just try to draw the water out of the cabbages, and then fermenting it for, um, you know, six weeks or longer. If you want to make sauerkraut, then you can take one of those fermented whole heads of cabbage out and shred it up. But the other thing you can do is peel off whole fermented leaves of the cabbage and stuff them in various ways. My host in Croatia made the most beautiful sarma stuffed cabbage and you know she would use these already fermented whole leaves of cabbage and as a result of the fermentation they're pliable and then she would stuff them with rice and meat and vegetables and then you stack them and then you just cook it for hours and it's just sort of like luscious so flavorful a beautiful hearty especially wintertime food In Europe, preserving vegetables with salt and encouraging the presence of lactic acid bacteria dominated fermentation cultures. However, across Asia, a completely different approach also came to the fore. This involved cultivating fungi, allowing molds to grow on grains. This way, entirely new foods and flavors were created. A prime example being koji from Japan. Koji is the Japanese name for either rice or sometimes barley or soybeans or, or other things grown with a particular fungus, Aspergillus oryzae. Koji is rarely eaten as a food in and of itself, but more often it is an element of further fermentation processes. What's extraordinary about koji is it has this huge diversity of digestive enzymes. It has amylase enzymes that uh, can break down complex carbohydrates into simple sugars that are fermentable into alcohol. It has protease enzymes that can break down proteins into amino acids. It even has lipase enzymes that can break down fats. 
The most widespread application of koji is to make alcohol out of rice. So, you know, koji is an essential ingredient in making sake. But it's also used as a starter for making a miso and for making soy sauce. And, you know, those beautiful umami flavors that develop from the breakdown of proteins into amino acids are, you know, largely the work of, of koji. Beyond Japan, I mean, there are, you know, koji-like starters, these sort of, you know, fungal growths that are used, I mean, everywhere. In China, in, in Korea, in Nepal, in Thailand, India. And in most cases, they are made not from a pure culture starter of a singular fungus, the way it is in the Japanese tradition, but rather using different botanical elements as a way of sort of getting the right fungus to grow on rice or amaranth or barley or millet or, or other grain. To make koji, steam rice, allow to cool, add microbial spores as a starter, mix in by hand, and after 24 hours, the fungus will start to appear as a chalky white dust kept under the correct conditions can be used over a period of months. When you're growing koji, your, your first experience is smelling koji. And, you know, if anyone had told me 20 years ago that, you know, that I could fall in love with a mold, I would have told them that, that they were crazy. But just the smell of koji as it's growing is just like incredibly sweet. You, you wake up in the morning and you go into the kitchen where it's incubating and growing. And, and, and there's just this like, you know, just gorgeous, sweet aroma. That's what characterizes koji is its sweetness because you know, the, the complex carbohydrates of the grain are, are breaking down into simple sugars. And, and so it smells sweet, it tastes sweet, and, you know, you can use it to make things sweet. Like there's a Japanese beverage called amazake that's a, a relatively short fermentation of rice with koji. And the result is, you know, something incredibly sweet. It's made just from rice and it's just very dramatic. And from village to village, community to community, unique and intricate relationships between humans, microbes and grains emerged. This could constitute a whole subfield of ethnobotany because, you know, this has been an important application of plants in people's food is, is, you know, getting the right organism to grow. I mean, you know, it's really only in the 20th century that we've started having, you know, little packets of a specific organism that we could use to, to start our fermentation, like the packet of yeast that you might have used to make a loaf of bread. But, you know, the earlier histories of these things, yeah, definitely emerged from people realizing that if a wad of cooked rice or, or other cooked grain is left near this particular set of freshly harvested botanicals, that this mold that we can recognize from its appearance as it develops will always grow. And I think a lot of the techniques that emerge that people use, you know, obviously we're not from microbiology and microscopes, but rather through what people could observe with their senses, what they could see, what they could smell, and in the end, what they could taste. To West Africa now, and a fermentation technique in which another set of microbes are put to use. This time to make beans and peas even more delicious. I'll use the name Dawa Dawa, which is the name for these fermented African locust beans that's used in parts of Nigeria. But there are a lot of different names, Iru, Sumbala, and many, many others, because every cultural tradition has their own version of exactly how they make this and, and how they use it and what they call it. But it's African locust beans, or in certain cases, other beans that are fermented generally, you know, they're cooked, removed, with, with their hulls removed. And and then they're fermented in a warm spot, but a warm ambient temperature. And the bacteria that develops is Bacillus subtilis, which is the same bacteria that is used in Japan to make a soybean ferment called natto. 
and the, the flavor of the fermented beans is, uh, it's an example of an alkaline ferment, and that means it has sort of notes of ammonia, which might sound terrible to some people, but, you know, actually when you use a little bit of it as a seasoning, it, it just adds this, like, incredible layer of complexity. There are a lot of flavors of fermentation that if you just try to eat them alone, they might be overpowering. But if you use a little bit of them as a seasoning, then they add a wonderful dimension of flavor that, you know, is very accessible and delicious. From the alkaline ferments of West Africa, Let's head to Central America for something sweet and intoxicating. Mexico has many varied fermentation traditions. One of the ones that just, you know, has made a huge impression on me and become something that I love is something that you really won't find outside of Mexico. And that's a fermented beverage called pulque that is fermented from the sap of the maguey. Maguey is a dryland succulent plant. It's also sometimes known as agave. Tequila is made from maguey, but so is pulque. And pulque is a very short fermentation. It's, you know, 24 to 48 hours. And the fermentation itself is just extremely straightforward. It's just a spontaneous fermentation of the sap of the plant. A sweet, sugary sap? Yeah, yeah. Actually, the, the sap in, in Spanish is called aguamiel which translates simply to honey water because it is just so sweet and luscious. This sweet, luscious beverage is extremely unstable and it doesn't stay sweet for long. And it spontaneously ferments into alcohol very quickly. And then if it's not consumed within a couple of days, it will just as quickly ferment into vinegar. So, you know, like many indigenous uh, fermented beverages around the world, there's a relatively brief window when it's delicious and got some alcohol and, you know, generally consumed fairly locally. It's not something that anyone has really figured out how to stabilize and export or ship to faraway places. So it's something that's exclusively available where the plant grows. In the mountains of northern Mexico, Sandor looked on as farmers went from one agave plant to another, carefully cutting and shaping them to make it possible to capture and harvest sap. It involves sort of creating a like what they call la puerta, a door, in order to access the center where the plant is beginning to stalk. The succulent leaves are very spiky, so care must be taken. Otherwise, you could get hurt from, from the spikes. As the plant is beginning to flower uh, or stalk up before it flowers, which really happens only once in the life of, of each plant, you know, then the beginnings of the stalk are removed and you cut a little sort of well into the center. And then it takes some time for that to heal over and then that's dug out a second time. And, and after that, every day, sap will accumulate in the little well that's created in the center and then collecting that in a bucket and to make a significant amount of pulque, you know, requires a, a field of maguey. And, you know, you go from plant to plant, removing roughly a cup of sap from each plant. And generally this happens twice a day. And uh, it's a spontaneous fermentation and it just ferments into alcohol. Sometimes back slopping is used where a little bit of the previous day's batch is, is mixed with the fresh aguamiel. And, you know, in some days in some places it might be less than 24 hours. In other days or other places, it might be 48 hours. But, you know, the trick is to ferment it while when a lot of the sugars have turned into alcohol, but there's still a little bit of sweetness there, but before it begins to turn into vinegar. Pulque comes from a plant that even in really tough drought conditions provides access to something to drink. I mean, maguey is, is just an incredible plant that, you know, that thrives in dry mountainous parts of Mexico. And, you know, in some places that's the predominant plant that you see is maguey because it's so tough and it can survive extremely dry conditions. Take a sip of pulque and what do you experience? I mean, pulque is just so 
delicious. I mean, I love the texture of it, the flavor balance of it. But, you know, of course, the flavor balance is always different. And, and you know, really every glass of pulque I've tried has been a, a little bit different, just depending upon what stage in the process the, the pulque maker harvested it. Sometimes it's got more sweetness to it. Sometimes it's got a little bit more vinegariness to it. Sometimes it's stronger alcohol, but it's always smooth and has this beautiful underlying flavor. And, you know, sometimes it, it develops like a slight viscosity that I really love. On this fermentation journey, let's head further south from Mexico and into the Amazon. Tucupi is made from cassava. Cassava is a, like a tuber that is grown these days in tropical regions all around the world, but is believed to have originated in the, in the Amazon. And one of the challenges of working with cassava is that, you know, in certain soils, it grows with these high levels of cyanide. Uh, and if people tried to eat unprocessed tubers, um, you know, they could be quite poisonous and make people very sick or even kill them. The typical process is to grate the cassava and then kind of wring it out and squeeze as much of the juice out of the grated uh, tubers as, as possible. The juice is really where the cyanide is concentrated. So the pressed gratings are then incorporated into different kinds of breads and, and pancakes and such. But the juice is fermented, and under the fermentation, the cyanide compounds break down into benign forms. And then tucubi is used in a number of ways. I mean, I've heard from people in Brazil that, it, that it's often used as, as a beverage. But, you know, what I experienced in Colombia, a chef in Bogota presented tucupi as a condiment, but the tucupi was cooked down from this sort of, you know, thin liquid that was originally pressed out of the cassava into this, you know, tarry black paste uh, that was used as a condiment. And, and, you know, other things were added, botanical elements, uh, uh, sometimes flavorful sour ants. And it's just cooked down into this black tarry substance with just such assertive, concentrated flavor. I mean, it's just like, it, it's perfect as a condiment because, you know, you just put a little bit on your food and you get this explosion of flavor from the, from the tukupi. So that was just very very exciting surprise to learn about. These foods and beverages are becoming endangered. Sandor has come across instances in which some of the world's biggest brewing and soft drinks companies have used their political and financial influence to undermine fermentation traditions and encouraging people to replace them with factory produced beverages. And I think in a lot of parts of the world, you find stories like that, where the mass production of some kind of Western beverage was funding some sort of a campaign against the traditional beverages and trying to convince people that the traditional beverages are somehow inherently unhygienic or dangerous, mm. which, which really is completely untrue. Protecting traditional knowledge from going extinct is one of the main reasons Sandor's fermentation mission continues. Our conversation took place at Sheep Drove Farm in Berkshire, where a large group had gathered to learn new skills. The gathering was organised by Martin Theobald, who, ten years ago, came across Sandor's book, The Art of Fermentation, which changed his life. Me and my partner, we've been living in London, uh, doing the office life and uh, the stress of the, the office life, fast lunches, fast food, and with that coming health issues as well. And we just came to a point where we said, OK, let's let's do a drastic change in our lives. And um, we bought the, the art of fermentation and it just made so much sense to us. I'm, I'm German and my partner is from Poland. Patricia, my, my partner, her, her grandmother, she's 95 now. She still lives by herself in a wooden house in the middle of a field with no hot water, no heating. And she grows her own vegetables and she makes her own pickles, uh, sauerkraut. So Patricia was very heavily exposed to fermented foods when growing up. 
And for me, it was really different because uh, a lot of people associate sauerkraut and ferments uh, also with Germany. But in Germany, it's not very trendy um, and a lot of the ferments are, are pasteurized. It's interesting for me that it took somebody from the US and his writing to make you rethink and, and have a different relationship with something that was part of your fading or forgotten food culture. Yeah, it's, 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 I totally agree with you. I'm talking to so many people who are into fermenting, who run their own fermentation businesses, and 99% of the people, or 99.9% .9 of the people, um, telling you that they started their business because of Sandor and his, his writings. So I think he, he, he did a, a vital part with um, the art of fermentation, and it's, it, it is a pillar of our business. Martin Theobald of Sewer Fermented Foods, inspired like so many by Sandal Katz, a teacher who inadvertently created a movement. For me, a lot of the significance of fermentation is about people reclaiming food, you know, kind of breaking out of this, what I would consider to be infantilizing role of purely being consumers of food and also see ourselves as, you know, creators and producers of food. And, you know, I think that it's very empowering. And I think that we need, you know, movements to reclaim our, our food. And I think that, you know, because fermentation is such an integral part of how people everywhere make effective use of their food resources, you know, and because fermented foods have so much potential to improve our health and well-being, it's just a very important part of people reclaiming food and taking control of our food and, and decentralizing our food production. Clearly, one of the main messages, we don't need to know the science, really, and a lot, so much of this is in, instinctive and inevitable, and yet science is helping us make a stronger and stronger case for fermentation and the potential of fermentation to aid our health. In the decades in which you've been making this case, you've no doubt seen the science change because of research and our appreciation of the complexity. Is that important? We're learning that a lot of the biochemical systems of our bodies, including, you know, the serotonin that regulates our brain function and how we think and how we feel, the biochemistry is to some degree dependent on bacteria in the gut. And what we don't really know is the precise nature of that. Mm. But certainly, you know, there, there have been studies that have suggested an impact from eating bacteria-rich foods, even on our brain function and our mental health. Mm. Um, so I think that these foods can be profound and, you know, I think that microbiology is illuminating more and more, but it's a slow process. You know, science takes time. Sandor Katz. And if you take a look through the Food Programme archive, you can find previous editions featuring Sandor, including his life through food and a step-by-step -step guide to fermentation. <laughs> 